Well, here I am, here you are, wherever you might be. We are um, going live this morning for a few different reasons, and one is to uh, just to communicate with you a few of our thoughts around uh, a gathering. As you know, and we know that uh, church is a back gathering, and uh, we aren't at the moment, so I just want to start out my message this morning explaining a few thoughts and ideas around why we haven't gathered yet. Um, but we're encouraging you to meet uh, in your house on a Sunday morning with those uh, in our congregation. Um, we are this morning, we have some of our, uh, our, we have our leaders here this morning, so they're going to shout out, Woohoo! Hey! Hey! There we go. Um, and we're going to have a, um, a leaders meeting after, straight after the, we, um, we preach this morning. And one of the things we're going to be talking about um, and looking further at is we have our vision month coming up in August, uh, which is going to be exciting. Um, so you can go to your mailbox. We're going to be mailing out and some posting out a, um, uh, a letter uh, to, you, to you all uh, this week. Um, we're going to be discussing a few of those thoughts and ideas with our, our leaders um, in and around explaining our Leader Legacy Month coming up in August. Uh, but this morning I just wanted to touch on the fact that we are still going live and only live um, and YouTube and Instagram because we have decided that we're not meeting yet as a church. And I just want to explain a few thoughts and ideas uh, around that. Firstly, the rules and regulations changed to make it easier for churches to meet just uh, in July, a couple of weeks ago. And we already decided that July and had our plans and prepared that July would be a month that we weren't going to meet. So we will be discussing some of those considerations that I'm going to share with you this morning with our um, team of leaders um, after we go live this morning. Um, and we will be, again, looking at it to consider what we do in the month of August. So uh, watch this space, but I just want to explain a few things. We had a meeting uh, with our leaders in INC on Tuesday night, a Zoom meeting, and we had, I think there was about 22 pastors present in that, that meeting. And about 50-50 of INC churches around our size um, are, are meeting uh, at the moment, and 50-50 aren't. And there's a few reasons why we particularly aren't, so we just want to explain a few of those, because we know that we're all keen and urgent and uh, excited about regathering, aren't we, team? Yes. yes. Amen. Amen. Um, one of the, obviously, the, the main thing for Taylor and I in, in considering how we move forward is just our responsibility to all of us in our particular church congregation. And we, we care for you and we care for your health. Um, and, and also we, we care for the regulations um, that are set out to protect our health and to protect the health of our, our community. And we feel at the moment, due to the social distancing requirements and the size of our church building and all that's involved in uh, complying with the regulations is that we just aren't able to do that adequ adequately um, and appropriately at the moment with your safety in mind and observing all the regulations. But we are, as I said, going to reconsider those um, aspects in, in August. Um, if we did meet, or when we do meet, uh, under current social distancing requirements, we believe that we would need to do two services. Um, and that immediately puts um, you know, expectation and pressure on all of us that are serving to, um, to see a, a service actually come together. And with the regulations that are required um, to actually meet, that would require quite a, you know, a committed and extensive team. And we just haven't been able to have those conversations with, um, with anyone at the moment, which leads me into all of us that are a part of Life Impact Church Mackay. If you feel that you can commit to uh, being a part of a team or part of the team that would oversee our Sunday services um, with the current guidelines with COVID-19, please ring us and let us know. Um, it would we would meet and we would go through um, a COVID-19 plan, our safe plan, there would need to be training involved in that. But if we're going to meet, we need a team of people that are committed to supporting and serving um, the church as we meet. Um, and as it stands at the moment, most of our guys that are committed in that space are, are families and have young children or you know, caring for grandchildren. And we just don't and aren't going to expect that, um, that those guys are going to be able to serve um, specifically and adequately in keeping all of us safe when our expectation is that they're going to be looking after and keeping our own children safe um, with social distancing and all that kind of thing as well. So, so there's one, one aspect of it. Um, we um, have three examples um, that were shared with us throughout this week with different churches that are meeting, and I just wanted to share those with you. One church um, and their interpretation 
of the cleaning aspect and keeping on top of deep cleans and those kinds of things in their service. They have a deep clean team. And as they interpret the regulations around cleaning, they are following all movements of any person in their congregation as they meet. So they have a team of people that are armed. They've got, um, I'm sure they've got tool belts, uh, clean belts on with um, the, the sprays and, and everything, they're ready to go. And their job during the Sunday service is if you get up and you go to the toilet, they follow you and everywhere you touch, they clean. And then as you come back to the service, they follow you back and do the same thing. Uh, that's how they're caring for their community in their church. That's how they believe complying with the regulations is, is actually appropriate. And uh, so that's one aspect of, of, of just keeping the place clean. So you can think about the complications um, and, and the feasibility of, of doing something like that with 50 people in a service um, worshipping God. You know how we do church and how that, that might look, and then you add children into that space. Um, so those guys, that's what they're doing. They're running multiple services, and they have a team that is committed to doing just that aspect. Um, we know another church that's meeting that um, has encouraged their congregation to worship quietly, um, during the worship service, that they're encouraging them to, to just maintain their seating, a seated position, so they don't get overexcited, they don't start dancing, they don't just forget about social distancing and suddenly they're in someone else's space. So that's what's happening in a particular worship service. Um, and there's also another church that um, I find this exciting, and I shared this with one of our church um, congregation yesterday. Um, they've actually no one's allowed to use their phones um, and take photos in the service because that might end up on a social media platform somewhere that an inspector's looking at and suddenly they can calculate and see that maybe there's a regulation that hasn't been complied with and then there's all kinds of ramifications from that. Uh, and the particular guy, um, gentleman I was talking to yesterday said, well, then I can't read my Bible. It's like, aha. Uh -huh. So there's so many things that are connected to uh, the regulations and how we might um, open. So... I just want to encourage us there that uh, we are considering our moving forward. We, we can't wait to gather together, um, but we're not going to do it at the expense of our, of our health and well-being um, and at the expense of the regulations. So be assured we're on it. We're thinking about it. We're talking about it. We're learning from other churches that are meeting. Um, and uh, that's one thing that's happening in INC. Those of us that aren't meeting... Um, have already been, we've, we've got an email from uh, uh, some pastors that are meeting with the, in a church our size and similar dynamics to give us their thoughts and their ideas around what they're doing and how it's working or not. So we will meet and we will reconvene around our gathering um, in August and you can watch this space, it's going to be exciting. So this morning I want to preach around uh, walking in the new uh, and connect it into purity. So if you have your Bibles on your phones, uh, or your books, you may open them to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. So we've been following a few themes uh, and, uh, over the last couple of months, and we've been thinking in and around three questions that we've been asking ourselves, and those are, do I long for the fullness of Christ? Do I desire to know Him intimately? Do I want more than anything to discover and be consumed with the glory of God? So as we just think about those three questions in our life, and do I long for the fullness? Do I desire to know him innately? And is there a, are we on a pursuit to be consumed and to discover his glory? I just want to speak in and around the area of purity in our life. So 1 Timothy 4.12, it's a well-known scripture. And uh, here we see Timothy being instructed and encouraged by, uh, by Paul um, let no one despise your youth, Timothy, but be an example, Timothy, to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. So here we see Timothy was a young man. He is a young leader, a young pastor, um, and he is being instructed and encouraged here to be an example in the area of the other things we share, but this morning I want to focus in on purity. To be an example in purity. He was no doubt experiencing and would experience the pressure um, of his youthfulness and his innocence. For Paul to be writing to Timothy here and communicating in such a way, we know that he was under pressure. Uh, that there were ones in and around, for, for Paul to say, don't, dis don't despise your youth. There was pressure on him to despise his youthfulness and his innocence 
in being an example to the other believers and leading them. Especially the older ones, uh, those that saw his position or his place um, of being young and innocent as being a negative in his life. And if we're going to consider walking in the new, um, it's new to us. It's a new life and it's new to those in and around our life that are experiencing and seeing the life of Christ in us. Think about a community or a culture that we're walking in and we suddenly present integrity, we suddenly present uh, honesty, we suddenly walk into a space where someone hasn't experienced that. It's new to them. So there's all those pressures in and around their life that we all face walking in the new. And one of the aspects of walking in the new that draws the despiser's attention and the rebuke is that we do things differently and that there's, there's an innocence in the way that we do things. So we can see here that, that Paul is encouraging Timothy to walk this out in a way that shows other believers that the new life he's, he's walking in. Also remember that this is new to the culture, it's new to the people, it's new to life. This is the new covenant. Jesus has, has just um, ascended to heaven. He's just that They're working out the apostles' doctrine. They're seeing it all connect together. So here's Timothy, a young man in faith, a young man in age, and he's responsible to walk out this new life and to, and to exemplify it in a culture where religious leaders didn't carry the essence of innocence. So in the area of purity, I want to just consider that we're thinking around, I know we all jump to what purity means in our life, and, and that can be a scary thing because we can all do a self-audit and think, well, that wasn't pure, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't innocent. But when we walk with the Spirit of God and we, and we, we, we follow Him, I believe that there's an essence of innocence that the Holy Spirit brings to our life. And, and as we just track this out this morning, that's what I want, to, I want us to consider, that in our attitude and our motives, there should be, and there's, there, there's some detail that Paul, I believe, is speaking to Timothy about. And as we look at a scripture in John that was absent in some of the rules, it's this essence of innocence, this, this, uh, this integrity, this in, this position of faultlessness, this, that, that it's not just in behaviour, it's not just that you can look at my life and you can go, well, that was innocent or that was pure, um, but all in and around my space, there's this innocence. Um, and, and I believe this is what Paul was talking to Timothy about. And it requires, to walk in an essence of innocence or purity, it requires attention to detail. So if we're just going to be haphazard or, um, or, or not really concerned about how someone might be perceiving my life, um, I believe purity will, will be open to the despiser's attack or the ire of a despiser in and around their life. So purity must be evident in the believer's life by example. So my life should exemplify or be an example that there's an undertone in my thinking, an undertone in my behaviour that's innocent, that carries an innocence. So Timothy was facing the ire of the despiser. And in response, he was set uh, an encouragement to make sure that his purity was exampled, that it was plain and it was clear. That Timothy, the new man Timothy was, to all believers would be seen to be pure. So Timothy's walking out this new life. He's walking in the new. And, and, and Paul is saying to him, there has to be an example, it has to be clear, it has to be evident that there's purity in your life. So what is purity? Well, in this particular scripture, the word purity is the Greek word hagnia, and it is the quality of cleanliness. It's, it's chastis, uh, chastity, chastity. And I know that chastity is talking specifically about you know, our sexuality, but it's derived from the word hagnos, which is the Greek word for innocent, modest, perfect, clean, pure, and chaste. So in your purity, Timothy, that you have to be an example of, of purity, there, there has to be the essence of innocence, the essence of modesty, um, and the desire for perfection in your life. And this is what a believer should be seen to carry, and this is what you, a believer, should be exemplifying and exampling to all the other believers that are walking in this new life as well. So if we look at the word pure, it simply means that there's nothing mixed 
that there's no extra substance or material that's mixed in your life. So Paul's saying to Timothy, it can't be mixed, it can't be a mix. And if you think about Timothy's experience and where he is and the, the time that he was alive, that this is what the Apostles' Doctrine was doing. It was setting down some guidelines and some standards around who Jesus Christ is and what his teachings now are under the New Covenant, that there's no mixture. There's no mix of old and new. And so for us, as we walk out this new life that we have in Christ, we have to give attention to detail that there's no mixture between the old and the new. In Titus 1.15, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. So purity is the state of being pure. It brings the things we profess to being the things we do. So Timothy was teaching. He was going to be responsible to oversee um, this new life, walking in the new. And there had to be a purity in his life that, he, that what he professed was actually what he did. And to be able to, prof to profess one thing and do it, there has to be in us the attention to detail of the essence of innocence. Otherwise, we'll mix the things up. They'll just, they, they just will be pressure. There'll be those that despise that in our life and there'll be pressure on us and suddenly there'll be um, a mixture and therefore purity um, won't be evident in our life. So purity is the essence of innocence. It's the freedom from, contamin from contamination. So if something's pure, it's free from contamination, which links us back into there's no mixture of substance or material. Um, it's, 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 pure, it's a pure form. So it's the freedom from contamination. So Paul was speaking to Timothy to be an example of the believers in the essence of your innocence, Timothy, through which it is clear that you are pure, that you are clean, and that you are clear in all that you teach, in all that you say, even as a youth, that what you profess is what you do. And that makes God known. Yes. Amen. Right? So, so there's a, the essence of innocence, Timothy, in your life, that what you profess mm. and what you do carries a purity, a, cl a, cl a clarity, that there's no mixture, even in your youth, even in the fact that you're walking out this new life, that what you say and what you do makes God known. Amen. It's good. You know that, that that's the essence of innocence in our life, and that's and that's the power and the detail of purity. So purity is more than you see me pure or clean, but it's the essence of innocence in all my life and all my dealings. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's it's more than just well you present purity by by what you say and by what you do. It's it's that deep um, desire to be innocent in all my dealings and all my thinking. And not innocence, innocent in the sense of free from guilt, but innocent in my desire and my passion to communicate and to live, um, which is we're going to see what a lack of that innocence does to people if you carry it, if you have an absence of innocence. We're going to go to John 11 in a second. So walking in the new. Timothy had to walk out this new life in innocence and the quality of character was important for this attitude to be without mixture. So that, so, so Timothy's, think about his life, think about his position. The Apostle Paul is teaching him what the new life looks like as he's living it, which is just like us. Like we're being taught by the Spirit of God what this new life looks like. Some of us have been in the new life longer than others. But there's, there's always pressure on us um, from our culture, from ourselves. Um, to lay down some of those things and mix them up. But if you think about Timothy, he's, he's walking right in the middle of mixture. And we are as well. You know, we go to work, we go to school, we, 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 we educate ourselves, we raise our children. We're, 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 we're citizens of the community where mixture is everywhere. And, and if, you, if you think about giving attention to detail of this essence of innocence, it will be clear that you walk in, that you walk differently. It will be clear. So the essence of innocence sets us apart. And that's what Paul was saying to Timothy. He was going, the essence of your innocence will set you apart from every other leader that's trying to grasp and walk through this mixture, the old and the new. Right? So we have a personal wrestle in our life uh, where the essence of innocence is so powerful and so important to be given detail in our life so that 
the mixture that we walk amongst is identified and separated and it'll be so clear as we grasp it. This was Timothy's challenge. And he had despisers all around waiting to pull him up. But not just to pull him up, but to cause him to change, to cause him to fall into mixture because that's what they were in. So we, we live and breathe with an essence of innocence that all God values, I value. So all God values, I value. So Paul was saying to Timothy, all that Jesus values, all that God values, you have to value. And if you can grasp that and you can give attention to detail to the values of God, then out of your life, purity will be seen. Because there will be an essence of innocence in all your dealings. You're going to be leading people. You're going to be communicating people. You're going to be teaching people. You're going to be supporting people in this new walk. And if, if there's a value in you that you value all that God values, you will work it out and you will be able to see the mixture and separate them. That's good preaching. All right. So see the mixture in our life and be able to separate them. Mm. So walking in the new stirs the essence of innocence. Not just innocence from sin, as I said. You know, we're justified. We're, we confess our sin before the Lord and, and we're sanctified, justified, we're set free from that. We're innocent before God. But it's not that innocence I'm talking about. It's not just a straight out, Timothy, you're innocent from sin because of your faith in Christ. You have to carry the innocence of Christ, mm. the innocence of the message and what that speaks about in your life. And it will be clear. It's good. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's good. Right, so it stirs the essence of innocence, not just innocence from sin through Christ, but an essence of innocence in the way we live. There is this sense about us that the values of God are upheld, that the values of God are honoured, and that the values of God are valued in our life. And if we're thinking about that, just with what I've shared about regathering and connecting together, for Taylor and I, there has to be an essence of innocence. Why would we, why we would regather? What are we doing coming together? How are we doing it? Are we valuing the values of God and valuing God and valuing you in that space? You know, so all these things come into play with all the decisions and all the things we do in our life. For Timothy, with the pressure and expectation that a young man in a new movement called the New Covenant had to lead people to live this way, those were the despisers in and around his face. Think about the despisers. They were the real religious leaders. They were the people in the community that, that, that had something to lose over this New Covenant way. There's this whole pressure of mixture that if we can just mix it up a bit, Timothy, there won't be so much pressure on us. Mm. Right? There won't be so much pressure if we can just mix it a bit. But Paul's saying to Timothy, ah, that can't be evident in your life. There has to be a sense that what you value is based on the values of God. So walking out this new value system of God as set forth by God through the revelation of the apostles, the apostles' doctrine, could be entrusted to Timothy a young, new believer. So he was walking in the new, was having to value the systems of God, this whole new covenant that Jesus Christ had introduced, that the apostles were unraveling in his time, required an essence of innocence so that all those around him could go, uh -huh, I see. Uh -huh, I understand it. I understand why the new is better than the old. I understand why following Jesus Christ is more beneficial to Everybody, including myself, in my life. This was Timothy's challenge, and it's all of our challenge right now today. We're all witnesses of the life of Christ. We're all called to be impacted and to impact others with the life of Christ. And if we carry purity, this essence of innocence in our life, there will be a clear divide and a clear marker in our life that something new has happened, that something has changed. And therefore, the demands of perfection are carried through our purity. Right? We all have demands of perfection in our life and, and most of your challenge when you share Jesus with someone is that they've seen that you're not perfect. Right? So they, they can see that you're talking about a God and a life that has this value of perfection on it because the one we serve, the one we follow, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ was perfect. So perfection is there. It's right in the centre of all that we do. But the essence of innocence allows our imperfections to settle and be separated from our values and being able to teach the values of God so that we can put aside our imperfections and be working on them and understand that, that we're forgiven of them and that we're innocent from those, 
but we carry this essence of innocence, which is so powerful and so important to being able to preach the gospel and seeing souls saved and people won to Christ. Right? So it's not that I have to walk perfectly. I serve the one who does. But this purity that Paul's talking about in Timothy's life would engage non-believers to believe in Jesus, despite Timothy's innocence in his age and his lack of skill and perfection and his lack of uh, experience and wisdom in his life, because purity would just come through and allow that mixture and that, that, that challenge to settle. So, so the demands of perfection would be carried through purity, the essence of his innocence. The demands of perfection would be carried through purity, which is the, innocent, the, the essence of his innocence. Let's turn to John 11, uh, and we'll see the absence, what the absence of innocence does. John 11, verse 55. Last week I was touching in and around this space with sincerity, and uh, I just want to read on in verse 55. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he would, or well, will he, will not, will he, will, what do you think? Will he come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, that they should report it, that they might seize him. So here we see activities all around the Passover. We see that in, according to Jewish law, there was a, you know, a seven-day period that um, people would come from, all the Jews would come from their, their, their far places and they would come for the Passover and there would be a purification process. They would be purifying themselves. And here we see the Pharisees, the leaders, the chief priests purifying themselves whilst plotting murder. There's the absence of innocence. There's a clear indication of the absence of innocence. So the Jews purified themselves while innocence was absent. In their purity, they plotted to seize and murder Jesus. So this is what Timothy was dealing with. Right? This is, so when Paul's talking to Timothy about, about being pure, he's going, you know the definition of impure. You know the absence of innocence in motive and in attitude where the outward expression and outward appearance uh, would seem to be holy, would seem to be perfect, but there's this inner mixture of imperfection and, and the absence of innocence that causes a great horror and a great injustice to the innocent. So walking out this new value system uh, is so important. If we, if we back up a, bit, a little bit in verse 45 to verse 43, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And one of them... Caphius, Caphius the, the high, the, being the, the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. So they're asking, what are we going to do? And he's like, don't you know? What are we going to do with this man Jesus? Going, what, don't you know? We have to kill him. Let's look on. This is what he says. Don't you know? You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. If you go back a couple of verses, you, you can see that they're concerned that the Romans will take away, that they will lose their place in their nation. So here's the high priest going, we can't have that happen. And you're asking how we're going to stop it? Well, I've got the clue. I've got the answer. It is exactly one thing. We have to remove the one man. We have to remove Jesus so that none of us perish. Now, verse 51. Now, this he did not say in his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied. So he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. But you can see that there is an absence of innocence. Right? So, so here's the, the, the chief priest, the high priest that year. He's, he's declaring that Jesus should die with an absence of innocence. 
because he's not considering that he's actually just prophesied that Jesus would die, because John says very clearly, the scriptures uh, reveal very clearly that he was actually prophesying. That absolutely, this one man, he's going to die, right? He's going to die for the sins of the world, and and there's going to be he's going to gather together in one in in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. He's prophesying this, but there's an absence of innocence in his life because his consideration is that we're going to lose our nation. So we get if we, if we take Jesus out right now, if we seize him, that one man's death will save the nation of Israel. It's powerful, right? So. So there's an absence of innocence. And that absence of innocence caused a horror of injustice against the innocent Son of God. So their lack of purity was revealed in the hypocrisy of their plot to kill kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yet they purified themselves. According to the law. So you you can express all these things, you can have all these things, but without... The essence of innocence in our life, That's so things good. can remain mixed. So your life, so so purity, the essence of innocence in your life, where the Holy Spirit leads and guides your life in a newfound innocence of heart, of motive, and of attitude, where all your moves have the essence of innocence as you are walking in the new. So the moves of the Pharisees and the religious leaders carried the absence of innocence. And so Paul is talking to Timothy, you're a leader, you're you're leading this new life, and all of us who are believers are leaders in the new life. We're leading in our world, in our space, in our family, in our communities. We're leading this new life, and we are commissioned and commanded to lead it with a purity, to have the essence of innocence as we walk. And as I've explained and shown this morning, there is a very clear difference uh, in, in how the absence of innocence in our life can affect others. Innocence is the freedom from guile or cunning. It's the freedom from corruption. It's blamelessness, it's impeccability, and it's faultlessness. So you can see in the Pharisees and the religious leaders, there there was corruption, there was guile, there was cunning. They would be blamed that there was no impeccability and faultlessness in their life, yet they had just purified themselves while they were plotting murder. As you pursue purity in your life, The Holy Spirit will engage you, he will inspire you, and he will make you a follower of Jesus Christ that has deep and lasting impact on those standing by in your life, that they might see Jesus. That they might see that he is truly the Son of God, and that they might believe on him. This was Paul's instruction and encouragement to Timothy. These corrupt, cunning, guilty, and shameful rulers would seek a betrayer to carry out their own betrayal of Jesus. So if we live without the, the innocence, the essence of innocence in our life, we will gather betrayers. There will be a gathering of those in our life that we seek out to do our dirty work. Judas Iscariot would become Jesus' betrayer. And we can read straight on in, in chapter 12 that, that, that it's mentioned here in verse 4. And one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, so you can see that in, in, from verse 55 of chapter 11 through to verse 57 that the Pharisees and the rulers, they're seeking someone to do their dirty work. And Paul's encouragement to Timothy was, mate, you have to keep your heart pure. Otherwise there'll be mixture and, 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 and there are ones around about you that are despising this truth in you, There's, that are despising this new way in you and they are wanting you to mix their ways and their attitudes so that you don't lead with purity. Judas Iscariot would become Jesus' betrayer, the reporter to the rulers so they could seize him. In verse uh, 57, it says, Now, of chapter 11, Now both the chief priests and Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him. So here's the heart of Judas being stirred and engaged to betray by the absence of innocence in the rulers and the people in the around that were influencing his life. They sought a betrayer in their plot to kill Jesus, and they sought to kill Lazarus, because on account of him, Jesus went away and followed, or Jesus, um, Jews went away and followed and believed Jesus. So the absence of innocence will impregnate and it'll, it'll carry 
and then influence all those in and around our space and we will become self-preservers, which is what the rulers were. And so Timothy, in leading this new life and this new walk and walking in the new, could not walk in self-preservation. He had to carry the essence of innocence. Purity, the essence of innocence, the absence of guile, the absence of cunning, the absence of corruption in all our life is critical to walking in the new. Young Timothy, walking in the new. This life in Christ, that he would be required to carry the essence of innocence as he walked and as he talked and as he taught and as he led and as he encouraged and as he inspired a people who knew only leaders, who knew only a way, who only knew rulers who lived with the absence of innocence and caused people to live under such bondage. When we live in purity, it will be distinct and clear to all that something new has come to our life and that, in fact, we are walking in the new. So I encourage you today, as we wrap up uh, our, our series on walking in the new, uh, to really give detail and attention to the essence of innocence in your life. Let's pray as I close. Father God, I thank you today that if you're requiring this, you're going to supply it. So we thank you as the Apostle Paul encouraged Timothy to walk in purity. He didn't just, he wasn't just left alone in this space to work out what was mixing in his life, to work out any corruption or guile or cunning that, that might cause him to seek after himself and therefore mix the message of Jesus Christ. You gave him the Holy Spirit. You gave him the Word. You gave him sound instruction and great doctrine. So today, I thank you, Holy Ghost, as we read your Word, as we incline our ear to the instruction and the commands of Jesus, as we follow him in the way you are with us, empowering us and equipping us to define any mixture in our lives so that we can sort it and separate it so that there can be the essence of innocence permeating and running through our life that will be a distinct attraction and a distinct, clear mark in the sand, Lord God, a mark in our life that we are walking in a new life and that others would see it, that others would know it, and that others would follow you and Jesus Christ in it. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us to impact the lives around and about us, that you've called us to go into all the world and make disciples. We thank you, Lord God, as you speak to us and as you minister to us in and around the purity of our life. Many are going to see that you are the Son of God. We can believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a fantastic day. See you next week.